Dr. Yavnik, who was from the university, respected members of the faculty, Mr. and Mrs. Amin, Dr. and Mrs. Agarwal, collector of Varodra, Ramiji, students of the university, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor and a privilege to be your keynote speaker and deliver the Foundation Day address on the 10th anniversary celebrations of this university. I'm confident that the university will grow from strength to strength under the able leadership of Dr. Nilay Yagnik, whom I have known for many years. He has outperformed in every role that has been assigned to him. And I have great respect for him. I am very fortunate, very fortunate that he is now leading your university. I have been here a few times. I was once invited to address National Academy of the Indian Railways, situated in this city. And I'm delighted that I'm once again addressing this university and the students and the faculty. At heart, I'm a teacher and a professor. If I'd <coughs> chosen to live in the United States, I'm sure I would have been part of the academia in that country. I chose to go back to my motherland. <clears throat> we live in a beautiful city. Vododra is a wonderful city. And I think it owes a lot to the then rulers, Sajira Vaipad, who was very education minded, and set up large funds out of both personal and state funds to set up universities in this wonderful city. And his grandson, Pratap Singh Rao Vaipad, who founded the Maharaja Sahaja Rao University and settled the trust as desired by his grandfather. I think this is a wonderful city. It's always a pleasure to be in the city which I have here. The theme for my talk, and I sincerely believe in this, is that education holds the key to India's economic development. <clears throat> it's the need of the hour. Gentlemen will understand the fact, and I think we need to publicize more and more, that India was the largest country by GDP for 1500 years. This has been published by the OECD based out of Paris, the published figure. We were the number one country in the whole world. <clears throat> a very capable country, a very talented country. Unfortunately, due to historical reasons, which I think you know as much as I do, we have continued to sit behind for a very long time. For about 200 odd years, our rate of growth of GDP was only 0.1% per annum. I repeat, 0.1% per annum. So naturally, you saw the results of that. I'm not blaming anybody, but this is a historical fact, and that's what happened. Therefore, there is a great and acute need to get this country back to the position that it rightly belongs to. And then it merits and all of you deserve. Which is why I am delighted that our Prime Minister repeatedly says that we want to get to five trillion dollars. He says it again and again and again. And our finance minister in the last budget reiterated that statement. If we get to five trillion dollars, we will rank at that time number three in the world number one being the United States, 
number two being China, and number three being India. <clears throat> I think it's a duty of everyone in this audience, everyone in this country, to make sure that aspiration of our people is met by once again getting into the development phase. Adam Smith, in his now famous book, The Wealth of Nations, published just before the Industrial Revolution in 1776, postulated that economic growth and wealth depends on labor and capital. Since then, I believe the world has changed. And the importance of both labor and capital has diminished. Labor has been substituted by mechanical means, the steam engine, the petrol engine, now solar power and so on. So the importance of both has reduced. And the main driver of economic development in the world which is obvious and can be seen by everyone in this audience, is knowledge and technology. So labor and capital have now been substituted by knowledge and technology. And both knowledge and technology are derived from education. So it's not rocket science that I tell you, that education holds the key in today's world, 100 years ago it was different, but in today's world, education holds the key to economic development, which all of us deserve, all of you deserve, and all of you merit. Therefore, a good education system, such as your university, holds the key to the future of our great country. You must understand that. Therefore, I was a little surprised and a little shocked that in the budget just presented a few days ago by Mrs. Nirmala Sitaram, there was no mention of funding being available to the education sector. I think we need to impress upon the government that that indeed is a key to economic development, which is the goal of, of this country. I would like to point out to you that the five most valuable companies in the world today, namely Amazon, Alphabet, also called Google, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, the five most valuable companies in the world today, are driven by technology, driven by technology and peace, founded on the foundation of education. You must understand that the world has changed. And therefore, if you are going to go forward, which we are going to, and we will reach our goal, I'm sure, education and technology hold the key to the goal that we are aspiring to. If you correlate economic development and per capita income with education, I am sure we will find a very strong correlation going forward, no matter which country you look at. If you look at the United States, you look at Japan, you look at Germany, France, UK, you find that the per capita income is high and economic development is high. There is a strong correlation to the education system in those countries. And therefore, I would like to re emphasize the fact that far greater resources are required in India to beef up our education system. I'd like to point out that many countries who have developed very rapidly in an economic sense have emphasized education. Example, Germany, which post Second World War rose very dramatically in an economic sense. Education is free. Even at the university, zero cost, 
the government pays the entire education cost. China, education is, is free and is developed economically. So you can see the correlation. I led a delegation to Sri Lanka last year as president of the IMC, which is the National Chamber of Business and Industry and Commerce. Sri Lanka and India became independent at about the same time. It would take a few months. The per capita income of Sri Lanka, despite 20 years of civil war, is two times that of India. You will be surprised to hear that. The average Sri Lankan earns twice of the average Indian. And I was shocked to find out that education in Sri Lanka is free. I repeat, education in Sri Lanka is free. So therefore, when you give importance to education, <coughs> I'm not saying education in India should be free. That's not my message. And I'm not sure we can afford that problem. But the message certainly is that we need to look at education differently. We need to emphasize education differently because Chavi Mohe, you cannot open the lock and that key. So let us now turn that key. I think that is the message that I want to give to all of you. Thanks to Prime Minister Narasimha Rao, post-1991, and I don't think he's given credit for this, I don't know why. <coughs> Our economic growth has accelerated. Prior to 1991, what is happened to 91? Our rate of growth varied from 2.5 to 3.5% per year, which was lower than the world average. Therefore, we continue to slip and not go ahead. It's only after 1991, and if you plot that curve, that our economic growth has accelerated. <clears throat> now, fortunately, our GDP of about $2.7 trillion, there is some debate on whether it's 2.7 now in the press, and I don't know what the truth is, but somewhere between 2.5 and $2.7 trillion is now number six. And if we continue this way, this year itself, I think, by the end of the year, we'll be number five. And behind the USA, China, Japan, Germany, and then we'll come to India. If we get to five trillion, I repeat, we'll become number three. I think we're on the right path, and I sincerely hope that this path will continue ahead of us. And we should be proud of that. Everyone here, who's rather shown the way in my opinion. This is one of the things I really mean that. See, when you look at India's economic development, <coughs> it, is, it is very funny. There are states which are very bad, and there are states which are very good. I was in Chennai three, four days ago, talking to a similar audience in that city, and I pointed out to them the Tamil Nadu, to my great surprise, my research it, has been growing at a very rapid rate. About 10 years ago, the rate of growth of GDP of Tamil Nadu was 14%. Twice that of India's national average. 14%. Please, please research it. Gujarat is similar, by the way. If we, if each state, gets to this kind of rate of growth, we become China. But there are states who are laggards, and all of you know that, UP, Bihar, many others, that are, that are a problem to this country. I must emphasize the fact that though our GDP is growing, our great concern is of per capita income. Ultimately what matters is what the average Indian earns. Our GDP at the end of this year will be roughly that of the United Kingdom, UK. We are 1300 million people, and the UK is 60 million people. What does that mean? It means that the average person in Great Britain 
produces 20 times what the average Indian produces. I repeat, the average citizen of UK produces 20 times what the average Indian produces. Matter of great concern. We're not that bad. We're very confident. I told the press a few minutes ago, about an hour ago. If you look at the CEOs of these five companies that are pointed out, the most valuable companies in the world, two of these companies, Microsoft and Google, are headed by Indians. Who are not born yet, they're born in India, educated in India. Now we are heading to the most valuable companies in the world. So we are all very capable. Everyone is audience is extremely competent and extremely capable. So we do need to have policies which facilitate free up. We have to free up everything. The moment you free up people and the aspiration and the hopes, I have talked to Rahul Bhai, you know, there is a government controlled education. They have no business controlling education. So we need to give freedom. The moment you give freedom, it takes off. One example which I pointed out was information technology. There's one sector where there was no government interference, zero. No licensing, no control. What happened? IT now contributes $175 billion to the Indian economy. The government said, Zero income tax. Only sector is a zero income tax on your export property. And what happened? Last year we exported 136 billion dollars worth of software. Unprecedented. It is now seven and a half percent of our GDP. So the right government policies. We as a nation, I can tell you, will compete and get better. Everyone else in the world. If for 1500 years we were number one, that says everything, doesn't it? It's, that's, it says it all. <clears throat> and I'm sure we need to liberate, free up, and reduce the controls we have, that we have in this country. I think the students who are here, I must tell you that you are fortunate to be studying in this wonderful university. But you have an enormous responsibility resting on your broad shoulders. You are confident that besides building your own career, which you will, you will also contribute to the growth and well-being of this great nation. I sincerely hope that all the students here will, will, will do that. So education, we understand education. India has always understood education. We have the oldest university in the world, Takshira. 2,700 years ago, which is now in Pakistan, but that time it was combined. So that time it was India. And I don't know how many of you know that, but Chanakya, or Kotilya, as it is called, so he was from Kerala, by the way. He went all the way from Kerala and became a professor in Takshila. And he became very famous. He was discovered by the Maurya kings. And then he was taken to by the Mauryas to Bihar at that time. And he became the Prime Minister of Chandragupta Maurya. And he wrote the first book in the world on economics called Arthur Shastra. You say Adams, but it's not, it was not Adams. It was Kotilya who wrote the first book on economics. And there are many other first who studied, by the way. It is the first Isaiah operation, by the way. Yeah, people see, we don't, we should deny history. The queen was expecting a baby and she was going to die, she was very sick. She actually cut open the womb and got the baby out, and the baby survived. The queen still died, unfortunately. So a genius. It comes out of education, I think. Education is the key to all of this. You bring the second 
oldest university in the world, Nalanda, which is now in Bihar. And we are again trying to revive it. And I sincerely hope that we are able to revive that university because these are treasures. We in India have treasures, like Tachina is unfortunately in Pakistan now, now Nalanda is still here, and we need to revive and explain to you how India has been the seat of education. I would like, also like to point out in Takshila, the admission criteria was you must be 16 years old. Uh, it was not a high school. Unless you are 16, you are not admitted there. And the students came from all over the world to Takshila. And professors came from all over India and the world to Takshila. So we understand the value of education. <coughs> Now, economic growth can be accelerated by a variety of factors. Education, of course, is one of them. Unfortunately, in 1947, when we became independent, I believe we thought that now that we are independent, we will grow. It will be automatic. It's not automatic. Economic growth is on the basis of the right economic policy. Fact of the matter is that our economic policies were not right. I believe we still have a long way to go, but I believe we are on the right path. And economic policies will govern growth as they do in most developing countries without any doubt. <laughs> there are two other factors I think that we need to understand. As a country, we need to understand very clearly. <clears throat> the first is hard work. I think our, our welfare economics, as we call it, has come in too soon. Jack Ma. The wealthiest Chinese, about a month ago, in a statement made to the Chinese. In China does well economically, the GDP has grown, but the per capita income is still low. The Jack Ma talking to Chinese said that I want each Chinese to work for 72 hours a week, which is 12 hours a day, 6 days a week. That's a very unpopular statement. If I tell most audiences in India that you should be working 12 hours a day, 6 days a week, they say, Father, okay, I work. It's not a popular thing to say. And, and we have become very social welfare oriented, which I think is a problem. It is not rocket science again if I say to work harder and longer, you produce more. It's obvious, right? So as a nation, we have too many holidays. Look at the banks. Every third day they are closed. Bank holidays. Ridiculous. So we need to put in Rabaz. The USA, when the per capita income was that of India about 100 years ago, the average working week was 60 hours. <laughs> it's all historical facts, they're all recorded facts. So I'm not telling you something in you. So you should work 10 hours a day, 6 days a week. Even today, it has longer working hours than India. Even today. So there is no substitute for hard work. So if you want to grow, you have to increase the way you work. It's very, very important. The other factor which can accelerate growth, in today's world particularly, is technology. <clears throat> if you deploy technology, you can accelerate production. Right? It's, I'm not telling you something which is not on that part of the obvious. The clever use of technology can increase production manifold. Now we need to leapfrog. The normal rate of growth will not do. How do you leapfrog? How do you work at twice, produce twice as much as other? One is hard work, as I mentioned. The other is by leveraging technology. It's very important. Therefore, when a lot of my friends, like in the American world, you know, we, in my company, 90% of the revenues are from overseas countries. And I travel there and I tell them we need technology, they say no, 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 no. 
the developed countries need technology, you are a developing country, we don't need technology. Right? And I told them, no, you're wrong. We need technology in India more than we need technology in the United States. Because it's only technology that can enable us to leapfrog economic development. One example of this, which has happened very recently, is telecommunications. All of you, I'm sure, are aware, even in the city of Mumbai, and every other city, I'm sure, Baroda must be true also. If you wanted a phone, in Bombay, the waiting list was 20 years. And one out of 50 had a phone line. It was a luxury to have a phone. Today, even the beggar on the street has a phone. Right? Your sabji wala, your dood wala, your servant, they have a phone. Why? Technology. Right? We have leveraged technology to reduce the cost of the phone. We reduce the cost of telecom, a, a phone call to the United States for 25 years ago. It's about 90 rupees a minute. Today, using WhatsApp, it is zero. You can make a phone call, free of cost. Right? So this is what technology can do. We need technology. There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever. We need technology very badly. And technology and knowledge, a real trade, comes out of education. Therefore, we need education. We need more people like you to drive this country forward. So that is the basis on which we can, we can go forward. Now let me talk about education. We have built wonderful, wonderful universities, the IITs, the IIMs, we talk about it. There's a 60 minute show in the United States on the IITs as we know. And these institutes have put India on the map of the world. However, we have three problems in education, I think. There are many, but I'll talk about three. First, our primary education has been 30% of India is still illiterate. It does not, we do not know how to read and write. Sri Lanka, this figure is 9%. Burma, Myanmar, 7%. Even Bangladesh is better than India. So one of the greatest failures of our government, and I'm not talking of which political party, it's not important. The greatest, one of the greatest failures of India post-independence has been that we have not been able to impart adequate primary education to our population. And without education, what are the person going to do? He's going to remain poor all his life. So failure number one in education is primary education. Though education is fundamental right, we have not implemented it in the manner that we should have. I'll tell you something which may surprise you. In the United States, if you are staying in a particular locality and your child has to be admitted to the school in that locality, the school has no option but to admit the child. Would you believe that? No option. They say they don't have a classroom or they don't have a teacher. The problem is not that of the child. The problem is that of the school. So what a change. And a lot of people live in particular communities because the school is there. Because they want education for the children to provide it in their environment. This is the importance of primary education. You must, you must understand that very, very carefully. Second problem that we have in education is our vocational or skill training. Over 80% of the job, maybe 90%, in our economy and for any economy, is not in doctors, lawyers, and child accountants. That's a very small population. Even IT, the total people employed are about a 40 to 50 lakhs. Nothing. When you look at the nation. These jobs are the vocation, the skills. 
carpenters, electricians, masons, tailors, even cab drivers. I was shocked to hear when I was when I got talking to the cabbie. You have to pass an exam. You cannot become a cab driver unless you go through vocational training and pass an exam. So that is the importance of vocational training. It's very crucial. I don't even understood that. And I think we need to correct it. Our Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, has estimated in his own statement that 40 crore Indians need to be imparted vocational training or skill training. So we have a horrendous job in front of us. We need to create 1 million jobs every month. I think we need to create 1 million jobs every month and the press is full of the unemployment problem that we are facing. The total population of Switzerland is only 9 million. We need to create 1 million jobs every month. So look at the magnitude of the problem. And these jobs are not in the profession. They are in the locations of the skill training. And therefore I think we need to pay great emphasis on vocational training. We need to emulate, which is the country they are very good at it. Germany. Excellent. Even the top one high school goes into vocational training. 50% of them go to vocational training. I led a delegation to, to, to Germany two years ago to study their vocational training. And I was staggered to find that vocational training there is a tripartite endeavor. Why the tripartite? The practical training is given by the companies. So they know the practice. The theoretical training is given by the universities. And the third was a great surprise to me. The certification is done by the chambers of commerce. I think CII. People like that, they are going to certify. So it's a three way deal. We have not understood that. We are relying on the ITIs to impart vocational training, but they have not succeeded for 70 years, and I don't think they can succeed. I'm sorry I'm saying this. But we can't write them off. They, they can't write them off. Therefore, we need another system. Now, let me Recite a story which I've heard, I don't know how true it is, though I've reason to believe it's true. When I went to the America to study my MBA in 1963, there was no MBA program in India. Zero. I heard that the proposal was to convert all our BCom programs into MBA programs. So that was proposal number one. And I believe, I really believe it's true. This is shot down by Vikram Sarabhai. Vikram Sarabhai said this is not work. You they have teach the same thing and the big one will be called MBA. I think a very fast idea. So we didn't do that. So what should we do? Just set up a parallel stream. Let the big one carry, don't threaten them. Cut it on. You cut them. You set up a parallel stream of MBA program. And now I believe there are about 100 MBA colleges in Mumbai alone. Am I right? And you would know more than I do. So then what? So you do, if the heart is blocked, you do a bypass. So you have to do a bypass. If you try to convert ITIs into better institutes, it will be, I think, an impossible job. Let the IITs do what the ITIs do what they're doing. You create a parallel path to import in part vocational training. And I think it will succeed. So this is the solution that I have for the vocational training program. The third problem, though we have created the IITs and IIMs, none of them rank in the top 100 universities of the world. Nirmala Sita Raman in her budget speech said that three of them are in the top 200. Which is probably true. Which is two IITs and the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. She said that. But we are a nation, we one sixth or one or sixth person in the world is in India. We need to have universities in the top ten. 
It's very, very important to do that. Let me tell you from another one. I was fortunate to have studied at MIT, that I got my MBA and then my PhD. In fact, I was the first Indian that got a PhD from the Stone School. And MIT has produced 85 Nobel laureates. MIT has produced 85 Nobel laureates. Put all our IITs and IIMs together, they have not produced even one Nobel laureate. Think about it. I was talking to IIT last week. They wanted some advice. So I went to them and I said, look, the average quality of the intake at IIT is better than MIT and Harvard. You'd be surprised to hear that. The average IQ of the student entering IIT is higher than MIT and Harvard. But the output is not as good. So we are very proud of it. And I am an IIT graduate myself. I am very proud of it. But why is it that you don't produce the top of the line? Introspect. Think about it. If you look at UK, of the 56 Prime Ministers in 1721, 41 have come from Oxford and Cambridge. I repeat, out of the 56 Prime Ministers of the UK, 41 have come from Oxford and Cambridge. There is something special about Oxford and Cambridge. What is that special? There is something there. If you look at the United States, of the 45 presidents in the United States, 15 have come from the Ivy League colleges. None of our Prime Ministers have come from IIT or IIT. <laughs> so, stay by them. So, sir, something fundamentally incorrect there. So, I think we need to introspect as to what we need to do and how we can transform it. Let, now, let me speak briefly about the faculty. I think we have brilliant faculty in us. Nevertheless, I have no doubt about it. We have brilliant faculty in IITs and IIMs, I have no doubt about that. The problem with our educating institutes is that the faculty is expected to teach, which of course is their primary job. But you look at the best universities, particularly in the United States, they are told very clearly that we have four roles. What are these four roles? First, of course, you have to teach. That's why you need to hire. Two, you have to research. It's a part of your job. Third, you've got to publish. If you don't publish, you're not going to go out. Fourth, you've got to consult. Particularly in the applied sciences, engineering, MBA program, not the pure sciences, but the applied sciences. You've got to go to the outside world. Only then can you can you change. Look at the look at an example. How Henry Kissinger was and is a professor at Harvard. He went to the outside world, Mr. the government, came back to the academia. John Kenneth Gilbert, Professor at Harvard. If you look at MIT, the top scientific advisor to the president is generally an MIT professor. So they are, and they teach well, they, they consult. Almost every MIT professor is, you know, very forced to consult. I know many universities here who don't allow the faculty to consult. They are barred. And I've never understood this. They said, hey, you have to learn, you have to learn. You have to learn. They don't, they don't understand the value of these four elements. You can't teach, yes, of course, that's your primary goal. You've got to research, very important. You've got to publish, it's very important to publish. And then you've got to consult. So we need to borrow these concepts from the West and from the best universities in the West if we want to get to where we expect them to be. We also need to understand education, particularly in the higher institutes, is changing. Because the rate of increase of knowledge is accelerating. 
I have to show up. All of us are going, you get how now you have been declared. The fact of the matter is the rate of change of knowledge is accelerating. Therefore, by the time a student graduates, he's already obsolete. So we have a huge problem. So what do you do? You impart knowledge, of course, but you teach the student how to learn. So that on his own, he can continue his education. And he means continuing education. When he comes back to the university, time and time again, to be able to renew his knowledge is very, very important. How do you do that? Well, at MIT, at least, when I was a student, they issued open book exams, which meant that you could take your notes, classroom notes, books, whatever you want, to the examination hall. And answer the question. Here, a lot of universities had, you can only answer yes or no. Because the grading becomes easier and there are less problems. This is ridiculous. Right? Now, you must have open book exams. And suddenly it changes. You'll be shocked to hear, even at that time, when I was a student, there were take home exams. Can you imagine that happening in India? Here's a question paper. Take it off. Do the required they can. Can you imagine that in India? The brother will answer, the sister will answer, the father will answer. Coaching class. Coaching class. See, I'm, I'm emphasizing this concept because I'm talking less education now, I'm not talking real education. If you look at that, then if you do these things, you find a sea change will take place. So it's very important to be able to understand that. Most, that is why some of our best students go abroad for education. It costs a dollar a day. You go to the United States, it costs 70, 80 thousand dollars a year. It's 50, 60, 60 lakhs of per year. A whole year program, two and a half hours work. Why do they go? Because they know the value of their system. They are willing to spend that kind of money. In my generation, my family, almost all of us went to the United States. Most of us came back. Five of us got MIT degrees, by the way. And there were seven PhDs in family. Because we saw the value of education. My grandchildren now, my grandfather, 17 years old. Four of them have gone to the United States for education. Why? Because we sincerely believe that their system is superior. We can maybe travel to the United States as a family all the time. So they're not there for fun. They go there to get the best education, and all of them come back for the benefit of this great country. And I think there's something to learn from their experience. Why do people spend this kind of money on education if it's of popular value? The other point I'd like to make to Dr. Yadne is you must start an endowment program. An endowment is where your students, when they go out to the world and they become successful with their will and become rich with some of their will, give back to the alma mater. And almost all American universities, particularly the better ones, are very wealthy because of endowments. However low the value of the endowment today, cash on hand is 40 billion dollars. 40 billion dollars. Two and a half lakh crores in the endowment fund. What do you do with this money? They give scholarships to students. They give professors, chair money, and many other ways, research. So you can gainfully employ this. This is the right time to start it. Ten years you are very mature. You will not get money every day, I know. It won't come the first year, I know. But the ball will start rolling. And some of your students, I'm sure, will be grateful to the university and will, out of the goodness of the heart, give back to the university and they'll grow. Money earns money. So when you have an endowment, the interest accumulates and it, it accelerates. I personally think that India is on the right path. 
we have Prime Minister Modi who was born in 1950 after independence. And therefore, he doesn't have the legacy baggage that many of the others have. And I am really surprised at the knowledge. He quotes, I don't know how he gets that, and I don't know whether the speech writers do it. But, but he has so much knowledge that he talks in his it really, I wonder how he gets that knowledge. He has come by a popular vote. More votes were cast in India in the last election than in ever been cast in any country in the world ever. Think about it. For 63 and some odd percent of Indian eligible voters voted. In the United States, the figure is 60%, by the way. So more Indians voted as a percentage than the United States of America. So we have become a vibrant democracy. And it's very important to become a vibrant democracy if you want to grow with it rapidly. And I'm delighted in a way that he has got a majority, and therefore he doesn't have to lean upon others to be dependent on them. I'm also delighted that he's talking about the right value system. Education is one thing. But we need to have the right value system. And Gujarat has it in great measure. I really believe that. I'm not saying Gujarat and Gujarat. The value system in Gujarat is extremely good as compared to many other states without naming them. So I think he's imbibing the right policies with the right majority. He has the passion, he has the leadership qualities. He doesn't take a single day holiday, works 12 hours a day, maybe more. So I think we have a wonderful leader in him, and I think he merits and deserves your wholehearted 100% support if you're going to take to India to where it deserves to be. And I'm sure all of you will make it happen. Gentlemen, I think I've finished the time allotted to me. This is 45 minutes. I'm precisely at 45. So I must congratulate each one of you here, particularly your students and your faculty for the great job they're doing. I read them briefly this afternoon and I was very impressed with all of them and I'm sure that they will do a wonderful job and the students of this university will go far, far ahead. And I'm sure under the leadership of Dr. Yamnik here, the institute will be counted among one of the best in the country. I have no doubt that it will happen. And I have no doubt that the education system we have will go from stem to stem to stem. And that you, your students, will give the best for themselves, for their family, for the state, and for the country at large. I'm sure they'll do that. Ladies and gentlemen, my best wishes to one and all. May God bless all of you. Thank you very much.